Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Jacob and Jacob podcast. I'm your host, Jacob Pear. As always, join my wonderful co-host, Jacob Robom. And today, we're joined by the multi-talented Jeff Schaefer. Jeff, thank you so much for coming on today. All right. Nice to meet you, Jacobs. Thank you for coming on. And Jeff, you're the co-creator of two shows that we both love, Dave and The League. But let's start with Dave, because season two comes out tomorrow. So what can fans expect from season two of Dave? Uh, well, I think I think season one surprised a lot of people. I think people didn't know what to expect at all. And they're like, oh, this is gonna be like the videos or or just, I don't know who this person is, but um, I think it surprised everybody with how much it had to say. And I think season two is, <laughs> season two is insane. It starts insane. Um, we tried really hard to make it different from last year yet. Like you can't surprise people the same way twice. Mm -hmm. So um, this year starts crazy, ends crazy. Um, it's pretty crazy in the middle. Uh, I guess what I'd say is this season we wanted to explore pressure and how a little bit of success um, makes a lot, lot, lot more pressure. Um, you two will find out in, in season two of your podcast, but as all of Dave's friends get a little taste of success, they're not always there for him. So, and he's like super stressed about making this album. And just when he's at the most stressed he's ever been in his life, all the people that he thought he could count on are like worried about their own stuff. So how did you and Lil Dicky link up to create the show? So I was, I was busy. I was not looking to like do another television show. I had a, a lot, of, I had a lot to do. Um, but a friend of mine was like, you got to take this meeting, meet with, you know, meet with little Dicky. And I knew who he was. And I, you know, the internet was like 50% little Dicky videos. I was like, I'm aware of him, but I'm like, you know, all right, sure. I'll meet him. And when we met, I was so surprised at how funny he was like in a curb way. Like he was telling all these stories about his life and it, it didn't matter that he was a, like a neurotic white Jewish rapper. Like he could have been like an accountant and his stories with like interacting with someone at the Apple store or whatever were still really funny. I was like, oh, this guy's funny. Um, and he had all these great stories. So I just said, well, let's keep talking. Like I wasn't like, I still wasn't like doing a show. I was like, but I'll meet with you again. So we met a few times and like by the third time I was like, oh, there's an actual show here. Cause there's like one, there's his funny stories. Two, there's his crazy life. And three, this guy is telling me he's gonna be like the biggest entertainer in the history of entertaining. And he felt this way when he hadn't done anything, when he hadn't even rapped once to his girlfriend, he's like, I'm gonna be a huge star. And I'm like, that's like cartoon level delusion, right? You're a crazy person. Um, and I'm like, that's a funny idea for a TV show. A guy who's so insanely confident that he's gonna be huge like, how does anybody live with that guy? How do you date that guy? So I thought that was a funny engine for a show. What is it like to work? Pretty, pretty awesome. And what is it like to work with Lil Dicky on the show together? Oh, he's great. I mean, he's, you know, I've worked with a lot of musicians before and, you know, amazingly talented, but like, it's different doing a TV show and doing a TV show is a lot of work. It's not just like rolling, you know, rolling out of bed, doing a show and coming back. So it's like a lot of musicians sort of catch a whiff of how much work it is and be like, oh, I don't want to do that. But Dave was like, I'm built for this. This is what I was doing. I was doing music so I could have a TV show. So he's such a hard worker. Um, I mean, he is busting his butt right now trying to get this show out to you fine people. Um, he's, he's so, 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 so driven. And he's such a hard worker that it's, he's a pleasure to work with. I think uh, we're all really looking forward to uh, the release of season two, but uh, I want to move on and talk about another show that we all love the show, the league that you co-created with your wife. Tell us about how you came up for that, with that idea. And why did you think it would be so successful? It's also very original at the time. Yeah, it's so weird. So, you know, the league, you know, is one of my favorite things we've ever done. And, and uh, I'm in a fantasy football league with my friends from high school. I've been in it for a while and the, the, the show started actually, it was Jackie, my wife's idea. Um, we were in, we were taking a vacation over Christmas. We were skiing in France. And um, there was like the day before Christmas, or like the Sunday before Christmas um, in France. 
and we were like having dinner at this. She'd gotten a reservation at this really nice French restaurant. But that Sunday night in France is like Sunday game time mm-hmm. back in the States. And I was in the Super Bowls of two leagues. And this is like, 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 or well before people had like cell phones. And so I'm like, I'm like, there wasn't like, I'm like telling her that my, uh, my stomach is getting sick from the French food and I have to go to the bathroom, but I'm not going to the bathroom. I'm running out to a snow drift to make like a, the most expensive call you can make to just to find out how I'm doing. <laughs> I just needed to know, I couldn't change anything. I just needed to know how I was doing. And the like third time I'm out there, I look up and then the, she's standing there in the doorway and she's just shaking her head going, this is the saddest, stupidest, funniest thing I've ever seen. It's like, this is a good idea for a show. Um, and so, you know, we're like, let's do a show about a fantasy football league. And the weirdest thing is people were like, oh, that's such a niche thing. Like, how can you do a show about like fantasy football? When we were pitching it and we're like, and this is back in 2009, we're like 35 million people play fantasy football. That's a pretty big niche. Like, like I don't know any priests who solve crimes and there's three of those shows. <laughs> like, so it didn't seem like a niche to us at all. And it wasn't, it's like, um, uh, but it's such a fun show about, it's not, it was, it wasn't just about fantasy football. It was about a bunch of old friends who play fantasy football. And that's the, I think the other thing that people really responded to, like people watched that didn't even like football, didn't even, would never like fantasy football um, because they liked watching this group of really wicked, really clever friends just dunk on each other all the time. Yeah, I mean, my mom has probably never watched an NFL game except for maybe two Super Bowls, and she was one of the league's biggest fans. She loved the show, so there you go. That's Dad. Awesome. Yeah. Love to hear that. Yeah, and our league, me and Earl's league, our trophy is called the Shiva. So was that a real-life thing, or was that something that you guys just wrote? So um, in my high school fantasy football league, um, our, we have a real trophy called the Shiva, and we have a real trophy for the loser called the Sacco. Um, <laughs> So when I would have my, like my high school friends, we would come out, we'd have a draft wherever the winner gets to pick where the draft is. And sometimes when the, like we had uh, the draft out in LA and we were poolside at this hotel with like the Shiva and the Sacco and people going, oh, that's like the league. And my friends were like, no, this is the league. <laughs> like, so, so yeah, we had a real Shiva and a real Sacco um, and they just get, they get sent around. I actually had to build like cases for them like, you know how you like would move like fine art because it kept getting moved from city to city and they were getting destroyed every time. So now it goes in this very special case in a big wood box and it gets shipped. So I got to ask, uh, how did you go into finding the cast for the league? Very good question. So we knew we wanted to do the show uh, semi-improvisationally, which is how we do curbs. So there's an outline, not a script. There's an outline that has lines in it and what the scene is. And But we wanted people that, could really like what we call value added. It could really, you know, make, frankly, make their own videos because we wanted the show to have uh, a trash talking component to it. We actually, we were doing like, you know, video chat room stuff before leagues were because we wanted to have that on TV. So um, we just had lots of like lunches and dinners and, and drinks and stuff with the funniest people we could find. And some of them we found at like, Uh, UCB and like a we went to an all night there was a 24 hour like improv marathon UCB improv marathon in New York Um, and we went to that and that's where we saw Manzukis who plays Rafi Mm. Uh, we're just like who is this guy he's amazing and um, John Lajoie was you know filling up the internet with funny songs before little Dicky so he was he seemed perfect we're like I can't believe Taco exists in real life he was actually the first one we cast um and then we just had, we sort of had met a whole bunch of people we liked. So we just had little, our, our auditions were just getting two or three of them together to see, cause it was, it doesn't matter how they are alone. It only mattered how they were with the group and what that group dynamic was. Um, that, those were really funny. I should dig those up. Those were hilarious. So I want to ask about some of the guest stars that you guys brought onto the show. What was it like bringing in uh, different celebrities? I know Matthew Barry came in for an episode. Marshawn Lynch was on the show and uh, a plethora of others. Uh, talk about bringing in those people and what they added to the show. I know for you Philly fans, we had Deshaun Jackson, we had Darren Sproles. Um, you know, the first season was tricky. I mean, God bless Antonio Gates, who was willing to come onto the show 
not knowing what the show was. I don't even know if we really knew what the show was. Um, funny thing, <laughs> so he was in this hot tub. He's supposed to be in this hot tub with Roxon, and we were shooting at this hotel, and we were able to use their spa, the ho- the, the the jacuzzi in their spa, but they weren't going to turn the heat off on it because they needed to use it again. So we're like, okay, whatever. So Antonio Gates is now sitting in a hot tub for like an hour and a half, and you start to sweat, <laughs> and we couldn't turn it off. So these poor guys just dripping with sweat. Um, but once the show came out, it became more of an incoming phone call business, but it's great. Um, J- uh, you know, JJ Watt is unbelievably funny. That guy, I mean, that guy could be a movie star, easy. Um, they were all they were all awesome. I mean, the one thing, sometimes they're nervous because they're like, wait, where's the script? Where's the lines? We're like, just be yourself. Don't worry about it. Trust me, our guys are gonna look like idiots. You're gonna look great. Um, but sometimes they get nervous. Like the first takes, people would be nervous. And when they're nervous, like when you're nervous, you don't talk as loud because you don't know what you want to say. Um, but our actors were great. They would just start insulting them. And they'd be like, what? And then it was like, oh, okay, we're in the locker room. All right, I get it. And then they would loosen up. So they would just start going after them, like on camera, and it would loosen them all up. And then they'd go like, okay, this is fun. I, I get this. I'm sure that Vegas draft of a JJ. Go on. It was one of the most fun episodes of the film in the whole series. He, man, everybody loved him. He was, we brought him, he was great. Marshawn Lynch, by the way, was so amazing. He, uh, he, we had him on twice. The first time we had him on, um, we'd written this scene and I'm a huge Seahawks fan. So, and so is Jackie. So we're like, we got to get Marshawn. And we had this, we had already finished shooting the whole season but we wanted this one scene with Marshawn. So we told FX, look, we got to get the crew back together. We got to have another day of shooting just for Marshawn Lynch. And the head of FX was like, uh, all right, my son's a fan, make sure you get an autograph. <laughs> so like, so they're like, okay. So we're all there, crew's there. We have the set, everybody's there. The only person who's not there is Marshawn. And we're like talking to his agent and we're like, where is he? And it's like, uh, he just called me. Uh, his uncle who was driving to the airport, there was an accident, he's okay, but they're not gonna make it. And I'm sitting there hearing this, like looking at the set that we built on a day that we weren't even supposed to be shooting. And I'm like, we're gonna get in so much trouble. <laughs> oh, no. just, just watching money getting set on fire. And the agent's like freaking out, it's like, I don't know. I told him meet me at the ho- lobby of the hotel at 10 o'clock and he's not. And then Marshawn just strolls up and he'd been punking his agent that he was still in, in Oakland. <laughs> And he just shows him and goes, all right, let's go. And <laughs> like, Marshawn, I'm so glad you punked your agent, but you also like punked the entire show and the like and all of FX. But he was he was so fun. And like he was that's what he was. He was just like he was a prankster, he was like game, he's like happy to talk to anybody. He was so different than like the quiet person in those interviews. He was awesome. Also, uh, want to ask you about. Jordan Cameron and Cameron Jordan having them in for an episode. What was it like to have those two in the same room together? Um, they're both really fun. And it was, you know, <laughs> that's one of those things. Um, we were actually, uh, Jordan, we like, it was one of those stories you have where like, well, this is never going to happen, right? What are the chances that like, we can get both of them on the same day? Like, cause we only have these little windows um, we pushed shooting as late as we could in the summer uh, to make sure that we were as accurate as possible, you know, with injuries and all that kind of stuff. But that only gave us a teeny window when NFL players were actually in Los Angeles. And it usually came around the ESPYs because everyone would come to LA for the ESPYs. So like that week we're like, okay, if you're here, like, can you do this? Can you do that? Because pretty soon they go to camp. Once they go to camp, you're basically done unless they have a bye week but that's hard. Like, so it's really tricky. So getting everybody there um, was crazy, but like they were so uh, I think all the players were so like game to do it and like be themselves and have fun with it. Um, That was, I love that scene, by the way, where Rex and they're both standing there and he doesn't know which one he drafted. That was uh, yeah, that's, that's, that is one of my favorite episodes actually. Now I got to ask, was there a real life league between the members Uh, people on the show together? uh for the uh whole cast yeah so the six cast members and jackie and i and when we started the show 
the only two people that had played fantasy football were Steve Ranazizi, who played Kevin, and myself. So we're like, let's start a league. And we're looking at each other going, oh, we got this. You'll win one year, I'll win the next year. <laughs> Neither of us made the playoffs. <laughs> Jenny won. Katie Azelton won the first year, killed us. Uh, it was, so we, it was called the Azelton Cup. The trophy was the Azelton Cup. She won it like once. Jackie won it twice. S Steve never won. Never won once. I remember, okay, the first season we were sitting, we were in the makeup trailer. Uh, Kevin and, and Taco, Steve Ranazizi and John Lajoie are in the makeup trailer. And Steve is just going off about how he lost in fantasy and like, you know, somebody put up like 40 points against him. It wasn't even like, he had this off, this just awesome like deluge of scoring and like the guy who was playing against didn't even have all his players in, like the lineup was wrong and he still lost, he couldn't believe it. And John goes, oh, that sucks, man, who are you playing? And Kevin turns, Steve turns and goes, you, I was <laughs> playing you. <laughs> so, Steve Law, uh, so John Lejoie played fantasy football just like Taco played fantasy football. Had no idea. That's, that's incredible. That, that's that's amazing. <laughs> so I want to I want to move on and talk about uh, Curb a little bit. Uh, obviously, Larry David. Uh, what was it like working with him and sort of like getting to know him and uh, talk about him a little bit? So I've worked with him on and off now for like over 25 years. Um, my, uh, I worked with, I worked on Seinfeld. Um, I was a, like a baby writer, then a regular writer, then uh, with my writing partner was a showrunner of Seinfeld. Um, and he was there for the first years I was there and then he wasn't there for the last two years. So I've been working with him for, he like basically taught us how to run a TV show, how to make a TV show, how to write a TV show, how to edit a TV show. Um, so he's fantastic. So I've been uh, working on Curb with him now for, for since season five. Um, and it's so fun because you're just making the show you wanna make. Like if someone said, oh, Larry's doing exactly what he wants to do and then he'll just, like it's a home video. Like, um, Alec, my old writing partner, said it best that there's no they. Like, what are they going to think? You know, do they know we're doing this? You know, there's no they. It's just we do what we do. Um, and he's so good at improvising and writing while he's improvising. So he'll be in a scene and the scene's going along and he'll start to laugh and he'll sort of go like this. And it's not about what happened. It's about what he's about to do. Because he knows, oh, I'm about to throw this huge monkey wrench into this scene. This is going to be great. And he's laughing, like imagining already, like him being in the editing room watching it. Um, it's, he is amazingly talented. He can like act and write and like watch the scene as he's acting at the same time. Very hard skill. I mean, what does a Larry David work process look like off uh, camera? I'll tell you. So here's what happens. So like, you know, we're in the office together and like, the two of us sort of write the season and here's how we write the season. Larry will come into the office and he'll say, oh, I was at this dinner party yesterday, last night, and the hosts just served tap water. Like who serves tap water at a dinner party? I should have said something. And I go, well, real Larry didn't say anything, but TV Larry sure is. And that's the start of a, an idea for an episode. Um, they're not all things that have happened to him, but it's like, it's like, uh, TV Larry is the neurotic Superman to like real Larry's neurotic Clark Kent. Like he gets to do all this wish fulfillment of, I wish I could have, I wish I did. And TV Larry gets to do it all. That's, that's awesome. So uh, moving on from uh, Larry David and uh, Curb and Steinfeld, I want to ask you, uh, of all the people you've worked in Hollywood with, who is the funniest of them all? Oh my gosh. I mean, see, I've been really lucky. I've gotten to work with just some of the best of the best of the best, right? Jerry Seinfeld, Larry David, Sasha Baron Cohen, uh, who we haven't even who I went around with the the world with, um, uh, but also like Seth Rogen, Manzukas, Nick Kroll, like all of these guys. Like they're all there's not there's never one like who's the the funniest. There's just all these amazing people. I know everyone likes to have those arguments. It's like it's the uh, it's the LeBron, Michael Jordan one. It's all this. And the answer is like, there's just, there's, there's allowed to be like, like 
two or three or four like really awesome people. <laughs> um, but they're all, um, all of these guys are do one thing the same. And Dave too, I will say, is like, they're always um, pushing. Like that no one sits there and goes like, uh, I did this, I know this works, I'm gonna do it again. They're always like, we did this, we have to do something else. How do we make it different? Oh, we did that before, we can't do it again. Like um, they're all, um, so they're always, always pushing, pushing, pushing like for something new, something different. And the other thing is they're all like watching people all the time. Like they're always like, that's weird. What is that guy doing? What is that? That's weird. Like, like every time they're doing what you should do if you want to be a writer, just take a lot of notes. Right? Whether it's mental notes, whether they're writing it in their phone. Larry David used to have like a little notebook. But anytime something awkward happens to you, anytime you do something stupid, anytime something you're like, that's not right. Like there may be a story in it. So, I mean, I remember at Seinfeld, we were trying to think of an idea for a show, trying to think of an idea for a show, just nothing we liked. And we went to lunch, we went to this like sandwich place and we went to the sandwich place, got like a, like a, a hoagie or whatever and paid for it, was putting money in the tip jar. And right when I was putting money in the tip jar, the guy turned away. So I'm like, ah, he's not gonna see me put the, put the money in the tip jar. So it's like, I didn't even tip him. So I'm like, I was thinking about that. It's like, oh, so George would put it in and then pull it out to do it again. And when he starts to pull it out, the guy would turn around so it looks like he's stealing. And that's where you get the idea. It wasn't sitting in the office. It was going out and embarrassing yourself in real life. Well, Jeff, we appreciate you coming on today. Before we let you go, we have one final question. So my co-host for our league was the Sacco two years in a row in, I think, 2018 and 2019. He had some blonde hair for a little bit. But I'm sure your league has said some great Sacco punishments. So what has been your favorite Sacco punishment that has happened in your real-life league? Well, the first thing you should do is the rest of the the rest of the league gets to name your team now. So, That's so that right away you've lost control of your team because you did not you did not give it the proper respect. You could not control it yourself, so someone else is going to name it for you. Um, That's one. Um, The uh, (laughs) the and by the way, for if everyone's listening, everyone should have a sacco because. When someone wins a league, when someone comes in first place, one person is happy. When someone loses, everybody else is happy. <laughs> so really, I just, just to all your listeners out there, do think hard about it. Do, do think hard about it and, and do make a loser's trophy. It's really, it's really gonna be worthwhile for everybody but one person. Um, so I will, I don't wanna, mm, let's see. Um, there was, there was one where everybody else in the league got to take buckets of rotten tomatoes <laughs> and, and, and the guy had to stand there and get pelted with these rotten By the way, you're not gonna like any of these things I'm gonna say. Um, I'll, in fact, since, <laughs> since I don't want you to come back and go, <laughs> you, you, what did you do to me? I'm gonna let your, your league figure it out. But if you wanna send me some options, I'm happy I'm I'm happy to look over them. Hey, hey I think we have a thank nice you for that. Uh, well, hey guys, really great talking to you. Um, I love that you're doing this, and uh, we'll talk again soon. Yes, thank you so much. We really appreciate it. All right, bye, Jacobs. <laughs>